year 72 in remembrance of me. This chapter is based on Matthew 26, 20-29, Mark 14, 17-25, Luke 22, 14-23, and John 13, 18-30. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. Christ was standing at the point of transition between two economies and their two great festivals. He, the spotless Lamb of God, was about to present Himself as a sin offering, that He would thus bring to an end the system of types and ceremonies that for four thousand years had pointed to His death. As He ate the Passover with His disciples, He instituted in its place the service that was to be the memorial of His great sacrifice. The national festival of the Jews was to pass away forever. The service which Christ established was to be observed by His followers in all lands and through all ages. The Passover was ordained as a commemoration of the deliverance of Israel from Egyptian bondage. God had directed that year by year, as the children should ask the meaning of this ordinance, the history should be repeated. Thus the wonderful deliverance was to be kept fresh in the minds of all. The ordinance of the Lord's Supper was given to commemorate the great deliverance wrought out as the result of the death of Christ, till He shall come the second time in power and glory. This ordinance is to be celebrated. It is the means by which His great work for us is to be kept fresh in our minds. At the time of their deliverance from Egypt, the children of Israel ate the Passover supper, standing with their loins girded, and with their staves in their hands, ready for their journey. The manner in which they celebrated this ordinance harmonized with their condition, for they were about to be thrust out of the land of Egypt, and were to begin a painful and difficult journey through the wilderness. But in Christ's time the condition of things had changed. They were not now about to be thrust out of a strange country, but were dwellers in their own land. In harmony with the rest that had been given them, the people then partook of the Passover supper in a reclining position. Couches were placed about the table, and the guests lay upon them, resting upon the left arm, and having the right hand free for use in eating. In this position a guest could lay his head upon the breast of the one who sat next above him, and the feet, being at the outer edge of the couch, could be washed by one passing around the outside of the circle. Christ is still at the table on which the Paschal Supper has been spread. The unleavened cakes used at the Passover season are before Him. The Passover wine, untouched by fermentation, is on the table. These emblems Christ employs to represent His own unblemished sacrifice. Nothing corrupted by fermentation, the symbol of sin and death, could represent the Lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessed it, and brake it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And He took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Judas the betrayer was present at the sacramental service. He received from Jesus the emblems of His broken body and His spilled blood. He heard the words, This do in remembrance of Me. And sitting there in the very presence of the Lamb of God, the betrayer brooded upon his own dark purposes, and cherished his sullen, revengeful thoughts. At the feet-washing Christ had given convincing proof 
that he understood the character of Judas. Ye are not all clean. John chapter 13, verse 11, he said. These words convinced the false disciple that Christ read his secret purpose. Now Christ spoke out more plainly. As they were seated at the table, he said, looking upon his disciples, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. But that the Scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Even now the disciples did not suspect Judas, but they saw that Christ appeared greatly troubled. A cloud settled over them all, a premonition of some dreadful calamity, the nature of which they did not understand. As they ate in silence, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. At these words amazement and consternation seized them. They could not comprehend how any one of them could deal treacherously with their divine teacher. For what cause could they betray him? And to whom? Whose heart could give birth to such a design? Surely not one of the favored twelve, who had been privileged above all others to hear his teachings, who had shared his wonderful love, and for whom he had shown such great regard by bringing them into close communion with himself. As they realized the import of his words, and remembered how true his sayings were, fear and self-distrust seized them. They began to search their own hearts to see if one thought against their master were harbored there. With the most painful emotion, one after another inquired, Lord, is it I? But Judas sat silent. John, in deep distress, at last inquired, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. The disciples had searched one another's faces closely as they asked, Lord, is it I? And now the silence of Judas drew all eyes to him. Amid the confusion of questions and expressions of astonishment, Judas had not heard the words of Jesus in answer to John's question. But now, to escape the scrutiny of the disciples, he asked as they had done, Master, is it I? Jesus solemnly replied, Thou hast said. In surprise and confusion at the exposure of his purpose, Judas rose hastily to leave the room. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Night it was to the traitor, as he turned away from Christ into the outer darkness. Until this step was taken, Judas had not passed beyond possibility of repentance. But when he left the presence of his Lord and his fellow disciples, the final decision had been made. He had passed the boundary line. Wonderful had been the long-suffering of Jesus in his dealing with this tempted soul. Nothing that could be done to save Judas had been left undone. After he had twice covenanted to betray his Lord, Jesus still gave him opportunity for repentance. By reading the secret purpose of the traitor's heart, Christ gave to Judas the final convincing evidence of his divinity. This was to the false disciple the last call to repentance. No appeal that the divine human heart of Christ could make had been spared. The waves of mercy, beaten back by stubborn pride, returned in a stronger tide of subduing love. But although surprised and alarmed at the discovery of his guilt, Judas became only the more determined. From the sacramental supper he went out to complete the work of betrayal. In pronouncing the woe upon Judas, Christ also had a purpose of mercy toward his disciples. He thus gave them the crowning evidence of his Messiahship. I tell you before it come, he said, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am. Had Jesus remained silent in apparent ignorance of what was to come upon him,
the disciples might have thought that their master had not divine foresight, and had been surprised and betrayed into the hands of the murderous mob. A year before, Jesus had told the disciples that He had chosen twelve, and that one was a devil. Now His words to Judas, showing that His treachery was fully known to His Master, would strengthen the faith of Christ's true followers during His humiliation. And when Judas should have come to his dreadful end, they would remember the woe that Jesus had pronounced upon the betrayer. And the Saviour had still another purpose. He had not withheld His ministry from him, whom He knew to be a traitor. The disciples did not understand His words when He said at the feet washing, Ye are not all clean. Nor yet when at the table He declared, He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. John chapter 13, verse 11 and verse 18. But afterward, when His meaning was made plain, they had something to consider as to the patience and mercy of God toward the most grievously erring. Though Jesus knew Judas from the beginning, He washed His feet, and the betrayer was privileged to unite with Christ in partaking of the sacrament. A long-suffering Savior held out every inducement for the sinner to receive Him, to repent, and to be cleansed from the defilement of sin. This example is for us. When we suppose one to be an error and sin, we are not to divorce ourselves from him. By no careless separation are we to leave him a prey to temptation, or drive him upon Satan's battleground. This is not Christ's method. It was because the disciples were erring and faulty that He washed their feet, and all but one of the twelve were thus brought to repentance. Christ's example forbids exclusiveness at the Lord's Supper. It is true that open sin excludes the guilty. This the Holy Spirit plainly teaches, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. But beyond this, none are to pass judgment. God has not left it with men to say, Who shall present themselves on these occasions? For who can read the heart? Who can distinguish the tares from the wheat? Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For whosoever shall eat this bread, and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body." 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, verse 27, and verse 29. When believers assemble to celebrate the ordinances, there are present messengers unseen by human eyes. There may be a Judas in the company, and if so, messengers from the prince of darkness are there, for they attend all who refuse to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Heavenly angels also are present. These unseen visitants are present on every such occasion. There may come into the company persons who are not in heart servants of truth and holiness, but who may wish to take part in the service. They should not be forbidden. There are witnesses present who were present when Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and of Judas. More than human eyes beheld the scene. Christ by the Holy Spirit is there to set the seal to His own ordinance. He is there to convict and soften the heart. Not a look, not a thought of contrition escapes His notice. For the repentant, broken-hearted one, He is waiting. All things are ready for that soul's reception. He who washed the feet of Judas longs to wash every heart from the stain of sin. None should exclude themselves from the communion, because some who are unworthy may be present. Every disciple is called upon to participate publicly, and thus bear witness that he accepts Christ as a personal Savior. It is at these His own appointments that Christ meets His people, and energizes them by His presence. Hearts and hands that are unworthy may even administer the ordinance yet Christ is there to minister to His children. All who come with their faith fixed upon Him will be greatly blessed. All who neglect these seasons of divine privilege will suffer loss. Of them it may appropriately be said, 
ye are not all clean. In partaking with his disciples of the bread and wine, Christ pledged himself to them as their Redeemer. He committed to them the new covenant by which all who receive him become children of God and joint heirs with Christ. By this covenant every blessing that heaven could bestow for this life and the life to come was theirs. This covenant deed was to be ratified with the blood of Christ, and the administration of the sacrament was to keep before the disciples the infinite sacrifice made for each of them individually as a part of the great whole of fallen humanity. But the communion service was not to be a season of sorrowing. This was not its purpose. As the Lord's disciples gather about His table, they are not to remember and lament their shortcomings. They are not to dwell upon their past religious experience, whether that experience has been elevating or depressing. They are not to recall the differences between them and their brethren. The preparatory service has embraced all this. The self-examination, the confession of sin, the reconciling of differences has all been done. Now they come to meet with Christ. They are not to stand in the shadow of the cross, but in its saving light. They are to open the soul to the bright beams of the Sun of Righteousness, with hearts cleansed by Christ's most precious blood, in full consciousness of His presence, although unseen. They are to hear His words, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. John chapter 14, verse 27. Our Lord says, Under conviction of sin, remember that I died for you. When oppressed and persecuted and afflicted for my sake and the gospels, remember my love, so great that for you I gave my life. When your duties appear stern and severe, and your burdens too heavy to bear, remember that for your sake I endured the cross, despising the shame. When your heart shrinks from the trying ordeal, remember that your Redeemer liveth to make intercession for you. The communion service points to Christ's second coming. It was designed to keep this hope vivid in the minds of the disciples. Whenever they met together to commemorate His death, they recounted how He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is My blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. In their tribulation they found comfort in the hope of their Lord's return. Unspeakably precious to them was the thought, As often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till He come. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. These are the things we are never to forget. The love of Jesus with its constraining power is to be kept fresh in our memory. Christ has instituted this service that it may speak to our senses of the love of God that has been expressed in our behalf. There can be no union between our souls and God except through Christ. The union and love between brother and brother must be cemented and rendered eternal by the love of Jesus and nothing less than the death of Christ could make His love efficacious for us. It is only because of His death that we can look up with joy to His second coming. His sacrifice is the center of our hope. Upon this we must fix our faith. The ordinances that point to our Lord's humiliation and suffering are regarded too much as a form. They were instituted for a purpose. Our senses need to be quickened to lay hold of the mystery of godliness. It is the privilege of all to comprehend far more than we do the expiatory sufferings of Christ. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so has the Son of Man been lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. To the cross of Calvary, bearing a dying Savior, we must look. Our eternal interests demand that we show faith in Christ. Our Lord has said, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink His blood, ye have no life in you. 
for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. John chapter 6, verses 53 through 55. This is true of our physical nature. To the death of Christ we owe even this earthly life. The bread we eat is the purchase of His broken body. The water we drink is bought by His spilled blood. Never one, saint or sinner, eats his daily food, but he is nourished by the body and the blood of Christ. The cross of Calvary is stamped on every loaf. It is reflected in every water spring. All this Christ has taught in appointing the emblems of His great sacrifice. The light shining from that communion service in the upper chamber makes sacred the provisions for our daily life. The family board becomes as the table of the Lord, and every meal a sacrament. And how much more are Christ's words true of our spiritual nature? He declares, Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life. It is by receiving the life for us, poured out on Calvary's cross, that we can live the life of holiness. And this life we receive by receiving His Word, by doing those things which He has commanded. Thus we become one with Him. He that eateth my flesh, He says, and drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him. And the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me." John chapter 6, verse 54, verse 56, and verse 57. To the Holy Communion this Scripture in a special sense applies. As faith contemplates our Lord's great sacrifice, the soul assimilates the spiritual life of Christ. That soul will receive spiritual strength from every communion. The service forms a living connection by which the believer is bound up with Christ, and thus bound up with the Father. In a special sense, it forms a connection between dependent human beings and a God. As we receive the bread and wine, symbolizing Christ's broken body and spilled blood, we in imagination join in the scene of communion in the upper chamber. We seem to be passing through the garden consecrated by the agony of Him who bore the sins of the world. We witness the struggle by which our reconciliation with God was obtained. Christ is set forth crucified among us. Looking upon the crucified Redeemer, we more fully comprehend the magnitude and meaning of the sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven. The plan of salvation is glorified before us, and the thought of Calvary awakens living and sacred emotions in our hearts. Praise to God, and the Lamb will be in our hearts and on our lips, for pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in memory the scenes of Calvary. He who beholds the Savior's matchless love will be elevated in thought, purified in heart, transformed in character. He will go forth to be a light to the world, to reflect in some degree this mysterious love. The more we contemplate the cross of Christ, the more fully shall we adopt the language of the Apostle when he said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14.